inspire. Welcome back to Starting Now. I'm your host, Jeff Saris. This is the show where I talk to entrepreneurs to dive into the various approaches to entrepreneurship. A lot of the episodes, I've talked to people that I've known and sort of encountered over the last decade, but today we're talking to someone who I am meeting for the first time. It is Pat Crowley of Chapool and Chapool Farms. Pat is a an entrepreneur who started a company around crickets and cricket flour. Um, they, they originally had bars, now they have cricket protein, and he's also focused on building a, I mean, not also, the focus is building a sustainable future and regenerative farming and really helping the planet in any way that he can. It was a great conversation. It was, I'm really glad that he took the time out of his busy day to uh, talk with us. And I think that you are going to really find this interesting. I mean, crickets, I, I know we all sort of immediately think consuming any sort of insects might be like a kind of vibe, but there's there are a lot of benefits to this approach, not only nutritionally, but also when it comes to uh, saving the planet and protecting the planet. So without further ado, let's dive into my conversation with Pat from Chapool. Oh, my family's from Southern California, so I went back out there for undergrad and then down to Tucson for a graduate program. Nice. Watershed hydrology. Oh, interesting. What, <laughs> what does that entail? <laughs> yeah. Well, a watershed is uh, it's a geographic feature. It's basically all of the area where water goes to a common place. So the mountain top, like the ridge lines where all the water would feed into one river and then flows to another area. So that's one watershed. And then the next ridge line over defines the next watershed. So hydrology is just water science and so it's really a high level view of of water on the planet and how it interacts with land and where do we get it and um how it's being used and the quality associated with it etc so yeah so i mean it feels like it ties it's maybe yeah. that was a little inspiration for where you're at but um i guess before we get too far into that um, how would you describe your company so your company is how do you pronounce it actually is it is it a hard ch or sh yeah, hard cha. Uh, okay. uh, either one. Chapool um, is Chapool was the first company. That's the food company. And now we're doing Chapool Farms, which is the insect farming operations that we're doing. Okay, yeah. So the main um, when you started the main company, you started yeah. with um, cricket. Was it cricket flour and bars, or just bars? Because I think you were you were or are doing bars as well as flour, if I understand correctly. We were, yeah. That was our okay. original product that we launched was the cricket. But that was essentially that was a vehicle for the the cricket flour, the protein powder. Mm -hmm. I didn't think launching an ingredient line made sense until it was a formulated product, and we demonstrated you know, proof of concept. For the marketplace so. yeah for sure i mean just to dive right in and you have to educate people on the benefits of cricket or like cricket flour cricket pro protein all of that That's, so there's a lot of education associated with it. we're an education <laughs> company a marketing uh -huh. company. Yeah. yeah i could i could imagine so i mean because just the initial response i imagine from most people is sort of a Ugh when it comes to eating any sort of insects is that does that sort of ring true for what you do yeah yeah my, it started eight years ago and yeah 80 percent of the people probably had that reaction but today it's it's significantly less and I, I don't know that that's actually the majority of, of people's reaction um if you interact with somebody and they've never heard of it yeah they're usually like what it's, <laughs> it's, it's called neophobia right? we're we evolved mm. to be afraid of eating something that our parents didn't feed us. It, it makes sense. Um, it's Interesting. A, you know, a survival mechanism. Uh, and so those of us that grew up in you know, the United States where Europeans have kind of wiped out the practice in, in North America um, didn't experience it growing up. And so we have that neophobia associated with it that comes off with like, uh, gross. <laughs> but yeah, it's really definitely. just a fear based. Yeah. Yeah. So what got you into like diving into crickets and cricket flower and the benefits um, around that for um, the planet? Because I feel like you have a very um, sustainable agricultural kind of approach sort of behind as the message behind your company. Yeah. I mean, 
certainly uh, that's been my motivation for it. I started uh, de- developing concern for uh, the future, uh, our grandchildren and, and the, the future generations after us about just their basic tenets of survival, you know, their ability to get food and water. We're, we're consuming those resources at an alarming rate. Um, and it's, you know, we're over consuming the, the resources for survival at a faster rate than they're being replenished naturally. So ultimately there will be a, a crossing uh, of <laughs> supply and demand for, um, yeah, survival resources. Um, and, and so that's what drove me to take more of an environmental education or w- watershed science. And, and so I, I dove into water and thought, okay, here's, I had done a fair amount of traveling um, after undergrad, which is where I started taking more of an environmental science focus. And then, um, you know, I hitchhiked my way through Mexico and Central America and then ended up living down in Panama uh, at a surf camp for about a year on a little island. Um, Mm -hmm. But along the way, you know, there were several water challenges in every, almost every community I I traveled through. And so I I decided to jump into water as one of the, of the, the link in the chain that I would contribute to in terms of providing a, a livable future for the planet. And so I went back to school to get you know, a d- education in water science, at every indication of, of traveling again and, and doing more development work in some of these areas I had traveled to, but uh, you know, through my education at you know, higher education, it took that to, to realize just how unsustainable our water use is here in the United States. And so focused here at home before, you know, going out and replicating some of the the problems that we were doing. And we just have a, we're blessed here in the United States with plentiful resources. And so that timeline for imperative scarcity is, is a little more accelerated elsewhere, but we're, we're headed down the same trajectory of overuse and, um, mm-hmm. now at, at alarming rates. And so, yeah, I, I dove into um, from the largest consumer of water on the planet and in the Western half of the United States, which is agriculture. And so I was trying to figure out how can we use less water for our food, the, the primary consumer of water. And, and from that lens, uh, just in, insects make sense. They're, they're far more efficient, um, certainly in terms of water. And that was really what got me excited about it first. It was, okay, this was a, this was a primary food staple in many areas on the globe, including North America, especially in these really arid regions. I was working in Utah and Arizona and Southern California. Um, and so how do we bring that back? And so it just, you know, really molded over. And I, and I thought that you know, rather than just start farming it, farming insects, uh, there needed to be a, a market demand first. And so mm-hmm. how do I work the supply chain backwards? And, and ultimately concluded we need to have a, a very convenient, readily accessible, delicious food product to introduce the concept to Americans and, and, and Europeans about eating insects to, to create a pull through demand for, for uh, the growth of insect agriculture in the United States to, to set up our future generations with a more um, sustainable and also resilient food supply as we're inevitably facing some significant changes to our climate and you know, geopolitical change, whatever it is, our food system is very fragile right now. Um, and, and minor disruptions, as we saw with COVID, can disrupt entire supply chain. So um, that, that's been the, the vision and, and the concept. And so we launched a food product and have been kind of working our way back down the supply chain now to where we're building large insect farms. But started with crickets really because there was some basic infrastructure here in the U.S., we we've been growing crickets for uh, like almost a hundred years. It started with, really, yeah. It started with fish bait, and then in the 1970s or so, the uh, Americans had this affinity for having reptiles as pets, and so oh yeah, the, yeah. The industry grew around that, um, and and so there were several cricket farms that we just reached out to and kind of co-developed a, a food grade. Um, insect line essentially. And so work them to feed them, you know, higher quality feed and slightly different uh, rearing practices. And then just pioneered, how do you, how do you take a cricket and it, it, it's farm stage and get it in, in someone's diet, <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah. develop the, the protein powder, um, 
you know, we were the first ones to, to put that in a product and launch that uh, back in 2012. And, and like I said, it was a, essentially it was a marketing company for the, mm-hmm. the industry. And so um, used all the channels that we could, uh, you know, Shark Tank included and, you know, got, got a lot of PR and press associated with it. And that was really the, the concept. And so now we've, now Chapool has kind of stepped back from the, the consumer facing products a little bit more. And we're more of an ingredient supplier uh, focusing on just getting the highest quality uh, insect protein because there are, as it's grown, there's been varying level of practices and you know, we're really focused on what we feed the insects, really high quality diet. Um, and then now, of course, on Chapool Farms, we're, we're building out our own facilities and we're building out, and that's, that's a whole nother area. We're starting to get into animal feed as well um, because the, the demand for those is, is a little greater you know, and by little a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's an already established market that's out yeah. there. So why not yeah. tap into it when you yeah. were reaching out to those initial farms that were doing the animal feed, what types of hurdles did you face and what kind of changes? Cause you mentioned like how you're rearing and feeding the critics themselves. <laughs> Was there much of a like pushback or anything that you had to work through? Oh yeah. Sorry. Sorry. There's somebody wants to join me in the, uh, the closet here. <laughs> This is Brit. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> it's all good. Do you mind if I'm in the closet? Nope. Go to <laughs> 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 Nice. Uh, sorry about that. But yeah. Uh, oh, no, it's all good. Some of the initial um, hurdles of what now? Yeah. So when you were reaching out and connecting with some of the existing farms, the existing infrastructure for animal feed crickets, um, you mentioned the rearing, the... Um, the types of food and the diet for the critics themselves. What kinds of hurdles did you face maybe from the the farm owners or from just sort of the system at large? Yeah, every step along the way were hurdles because it was just, it was a new concept to everyone that we were talking mm-hmm. to. Everyone in the supply chain, the consumer, the retailers, it was brand new. And so just that level of education, I mean, you know, when you have a new product, often you, you have to educate the consumer, but we had to educate everyone. And so yeah. initially where we found our, our best relationship on the, the cricket farmer was um, a multi-generational farm. And so th- I think that he was third generation cricket farmer it had been passed down grandfather, father, and now he was running it. And, and so he had seen the growth of the industry from different markets. And so really looked at human edible consumption of crickets as the next phase. And so he was really willing to, to pioneer this space with us and take on some of the early burden of you know, rearing them differently because it cost them extra money. And um, mm-hmm. we weren't necessarily buying them for more at the time. Um, and so it, it was really one of the biggest hurdles, just um, finding the pioneers that, that wanted that pioneering because the vast majority of people uh, want to be the second to do something <laughs> or the third <laughs> yeah. or the fourth, but not the first. <laughs> yeah. It's so much more expensive to be at the forefront of oh any sort of wave like that. Yeah. And scary for people, you know, a mm-hmm. retailer and you know, putting that on the retail shelf when nobody has ever done it before. It's, that's a risk for them of, you know, what are our customers going to say or whatnot. And, um, so it was just, that was the hurdles is identifying all the innovators at every link in the chain from supply to distribution to consumer. Um, yeah, but luckily, you know, we, especially with the message of, of authentically, here's what we're doing and why we're doing it. That, that resonated because you now the problems are, the problems have been, um, have, there's been education behind the problems, but these large solutions just aren't there. Um, and so people are craving alternatives. You know, we, we know what mass produced, you know, petrochemical based agriculture does to, to the planet, to our bodies, you know, highly processed foods, what that does, but how, how easy is it for alternatives? And, and luckily more and more every year, but, um, it's not, it's not as accessible as it should be. The, The solutions to a lot of the major challenges that we have in front of us. Yeah. So um, conventional agriculture versus a cricket farm, 
how does it differ? Like, I don't even have a vision for what a cricket farm would be, you know, because I think we all think of like cows and pasture and like gardens and things like that. But what what does a cricket farm actually look like? Yeah, so we're actually farming a different species right now. We're not farming crickets. We're farming a, a black soldier fly larva. Um, come on, That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is a high traffic uh, closet here. Oh Sorry. yeah, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be on a podcast? Oh sure. <laughs> um, so really conceptually. Um, it, we're taking a, a, a fundamental change and a 180 degree turn on kind of conventional agriculture. The trend has been decreasing diversity. And so we've mm-hmm. been focused on monoculture and we've been focused on kind of like a chemistry based approach to our soil. So it's just N- nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, you know, NPKs. And, and it's a, it's a linear equation of pump them in, uh, and, and we get those from kind of finite resources. So those are mined fertilizers. Um, and what that's done, unfortunately, and then, you know, spray massive amounts of pesticides to, to kill all the pests. And so what's that, that has done is decreased the life, really the biodiversity within these fields. And, you know, it's, it's critical to the, the biodiversity is critical to every ecosystem, including agriculture and, and more and more reali- realizing, you know, especially critical within our soil. And so this application of petrochemicals and pesticides, we're, we've just killed the bio- biology within our soil. And, and it's critical to you know, immediate nutritional needs of plants, but also the long-term viability of that soil to even produce plants. Um, mm-hmm. And so what we're doing with insects is, <laughs> sorry, can you hear the printers? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I thought this was going to be a quiet place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let me know if for, are you editing this or is this live stream here? <laughs> oh no. Yeah. I will be editing it, but okay. yeah, let we'll leave my... it in. This is all part of the, the <laughs> reality of a business. You know, yeah. I mean, you have to, you're finding a spot that's sort of secluded and quiet, but then there's this things that happen. Yeah. Just how it goes, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, it, what, what really helps is um, understanding that insects are, are just a, a super organism. Uh, and, and essentially what they are is more midwives for entire ecosystems of microbes. And so their, their digestive tract is full of beneficial bacteria and fungi and enzymes that um, are critical to, to soil health. And that's what, that's a role that insects play in the natural environment is that they take organic material decomposing and they process that and they, um, they, they add those beneficial microbes to the soil, which then help you know, fix nitrogen and foster mineral uptake for plants and, you know, aerate soil. And um, as we've headed away from biodiversity, this, as I said, is a 180 degree turn of adding biodiversity back into agricultural landscape. And so fundamentally, that's what we're trying to do is put, put more life back into a system that has been devoid of life. And we've been focused on, you know, monoculture and we've been losing varieties of plants and even within various plants we're we're focusing on single genetics and it's just an awful risk management strategy um, in terms of you know changes disrupting our our food supply and so we it's critical that we have more diversity in plants and animals and fungus fungal communities and bacterial communities and um, so that's kind of high level but then focusing on what it actually looks like is we're now, as we develop farms, we're singularly focused on taking organic waste streams, essentially. So um, of all of the plant agriculture on the planet, what we harvest, the biomass that we harvest, only about half of that is edible. And the other half is inedible to humans. And then mm-hmm. of the edible piece, we waste about 30% of edible food. So we we throw away food at the from grocery stores, from in our personal and our houses, just at the farm level. And so we have massive amounts of, of plant organic material that ultimately most of that will go into a landfill. And that's a, one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gases and uh, global climate change. And, you know, if you look at some of the research coming out, that's 
one of the most significant things we can do as a, as a population is eliminate organic material from our landfills. And so we take that organic material as the feed for insects. And so mm-hmm. we, that comes into our farm and then we're raising a, a black soldier fly and we, we harvest at the larva stage. And so the, the larva kind of looks like a mealworm. Um, and that's what we're selling into to chicken and, and fish feed at this point. But essentially that, that feed comes in and then it, two weeks later, we're left with zero waste. We have two things. We have the larva that comes out and then their frass, which is their manure, but, you know, complete with all those beneficial microbes. So, and then that just goes right in as a, as a bio uh, soil additive. And so we can take that waste and get it right back in the soil with all those beneficial microbes in only two weeks time. So much faster nice. than composting systems, et cetera. And then yeah, now a, we've turned waste into a, a protein and, and fat source that is digestible to, to humans and other animals. Yeah, that's a beautiful system. I mean, I love just the sustainability throughout without, I mean, essentially zero waste. I mean, essentially, that's amazing. And when when you say then, like you're feeding the insects, like what, like what visual should I expect? Is it almost like... Um, is it almost like a composting, like a large composting system? Like what, what does that entail? <laughs> yeah. I mean, insect agriculture is thousands of years old. And so it's very basic. It can be very basic and it has been actually in the United States, fairly manual operations. Um, but it's also now kind of the next phase we're getting pretty sophisticated with it. So ultimately it's a series of trays and it was taking a step back. Like it is beautiful. And it's it's an incredible system. It's it's just nature. And mm-hmm. That's what that's why it's so beautiful. It's just oh, we're trying yeah. to step back a little bit and not over engineer our food supply and over process it, but but kind of make it replicate what a natural ecosystem looks like more. And so we just provide a really nice home for the insects that kind of replicates what they would be doing in their natural ecosystem. So we we have a series of trays and we put that material down. And so right now we're working with a couple of different feeds coming in. One of them is um, cannabis after, or hemp more um, Mm -hmm. precisely, after the CBD extraction process, you're left with a a material, there's the plant material that there's not a lot of application for. And so uh, we've been feeding our insects that in addition to, you know, here in the Willamette Valley, there's a lot of, a lot of wine being produced, but then the grape skins, there's a lot of that will end up in landfills as well. And so we make a mixture of those and then you know, there's other farms around the world doing brewer's waste after you make beer and and then all the way to to food waste and you know with the at a grocery store all of the expired fruits and vegetables that they throw away it was, it's a fantastic feed for insects um and, and so yeah we we grow them on kind of various various waste streams at this point or, or food food sources for them Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the term waste stream makes it sound yeah. like not good, but I mean, this is just I know, food. I should, yeah, food that we just, I think is what I should be saying from <laughs> Oh, no, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not no, trying to correct. I just important. meant like... No, no, it's important. You're, you're spot on. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting... Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting system. And I love how you said we're just looking back at nature because that is the thing. We, with farming, you mentioned like monocrops and like monocultures and all these things focusing and just draining the soil where even when it comes to animal agriculture, they have this cycling, the natural cycling that farms would do that we just got away from. We just jam all the animals in or whatever it is and just pump it as long as we can. And I love the thought of using insects and this type of approach to essentially regenerate what naturally was there before. It's Really smart. I love it. And, and you know what? It, it, it's also interrelated. And, and so the, the concept of regeneration and adding biodiversity it applies to the soil, applies to the plant communities, but also applies to our nutrition as well. And, you know, if you look at kind of the front line of science around our gut microbiome, um, it's we've been heading towards lack of diversity and, and therefore, mm-hmm. you know, lack of um, or decreasing uh, immune response to, to things like viruses. <laughs> mm-hmm. know, there's one around us right now, I hear. <laughs> uh, but, but that it's, you know, insects, we, we have the enzymes to process them. They're, they're full of prebiotic fiber. And, and like I said, they contain all these beneficial microbes. So 
there's there's plenty of studies showing that you eat an insect and, and all of a sudden your gut microbiome it, it flourishes and so there's there's we have lots of academic work coming out for more on the animal side it, you know, chickens and fish they're just far less susceptible to diseases and viruses when they have insects in their diet because well they evolved eating insects not heavily processed mm -hmm. soy <laughs> the yeah. same with humans you know mm -hmm. um so what would your ultimate goal be with, um, maybe not the company, but just sort of us, like say in the US, would you like to see people consuming more um, crickets and various insects? And like, what, what would be sort of your perfect ideal future? Yeah, it, it, it's all about biodiversity. Um, and, and so my ideal future is, is kind of breaking down the fact that we have four species of plants that are 90% of our agricultural landscape and, and seeing far more localized growth around localized climates. And of course, insects are a part of that and insects as a, a waste management strategy for cities, but also, you know, a, an additional protein and fat source for for humans and, and animals. And so I want to see a lot more of it and a lot more diverse business models associated with it and, and raising them on different substrates and uh, byproducts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, and so I, my ideal vision is, you know, in 10 years, you, you go to your local farmer's market and maybe there's three different species of insects available um, that have been raised there locally. And, and then of course, as a result, the, the soil in that area is healthier and um, you know, there's there's less waste going into landfills in that area and, and that's happening just all over. And so if we can be a, a spark of, of inspiration, that's we will have done our job. Yeah. And what are some ways then that you can use insects in like incorporate them into your diet? Because you have the flour um, and the, the protein. What types of things can you do with that? Yeah, that that was one of the reasons why we stepped back into the um, into the ingredient supply is to foster that creativity from the crowd because it's you know almost endless. You know what can you do with almost any protein powder or flour? And so you know you can make your own protein bars, you can make baked goods, you can add it to smoothies, you can just add it as a little protein supplement to oatmeal. Um, but really, the sky's the limit um, in terms of its applications and yeah, we've had lots of creative uh, recipes come our way. We have some some recipes on our Chipotle page as well. Um, but I, I'm mostly, I'm a really functional eater, so I mainly just throw it in smoothies and, and blend other stuff up and then drink yeah. it and go. <laughs> <laughs> How much would you say you consume of it? Do you have any sort of regimen or is it just uh, like every day, every couple of days have a little? I don't have any regimen anywhere in my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, I need a lot more consistency. Um, yeah, there's no average day for me, but it's definitely several times a week. It, it, um, our, our cricket flour goes into one of our smoothies. And I usually eat, um, we have a, a flavored, we have a, a chocolate version and a vanilla version. So we mix other proteins and, and flavors in there. Um, so that's what I use. I just dump that in a smoothie, but yeah, several times a week. Yeah. Um, I, actually I, I incorporated into, I have a little four and a half year old and, and he was, having trouble getting iron in his diet and that was a, a quick fix started giving him smoothies with the cricket flour and you know his iron levels stabilized and um, that's actually what got me into the a more of a habit of it so i would mm. when we ate when we produced the bars which we're not producing anymore ah that's what i ate all day long <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was never really a smoothie drinker um and despite you know launching a product in that category but um kind of to meet his nutritional needs, I incorporated that diet. And then it's like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. <laughs> after <eating laughs> nice. Maybe I was iron deficient, B12 deficient. Yeah. Yeah. Especially all those nutrients, like you said, everything that we get from the insects that we just aren't m maybe getting from other sources. I mean, yeah. you, you can notice a difference when the diet shifts in a positive direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. So business-wise, when you started, so you said eight years ago, mm -hmm. what size was the business? How many people were involved and how has it grown and changed over the course of the eight years? I mean, going from the bars to the, the flour is a major change going into farming. But um, what does it look like sort of in the early days? Early days, I mean, I was a, 
I was an environmental scientist and whitewater rafting guide and surf guide. So I, I didn't have much savings to put into a business. And so mm-hmm. I think I put in like $2,000 I'd saved up essentially my life savings. Um, so very bootstrap you know, laminate lemonade stand early days. Um, and just, there was enough money. I got another 20, 20, $2,500 from a friend. And that was the seed money was, you know, close to $5,000. And most of that went to nutritional testing to make sure it was, we were meeting all the FDA regulations. Um, and then a couple of prototypes. And then we went out to, um, some farmer's market stands, et cetera. And then got some filming, uh, of people consuming it and then use that into a Kickstarter campaign. And so we tried to raise 10,000. We ended up raising 16,000 in, in two week campaign. And that was, that was the seed money. And then from there it was bootstrapped. And, um, that was like our first batch. We'd sell that and we'd buy a slightly bigger, you know, one, 1. 1.2 times that batch. And then, <laughs> you know, we just organically grew it for the first two years of the company. Um, just really organic growth. Um, and then in 2014 is when we appeared on Shark Tank um, and hadn't taken on any investment money to date uh, going into there, but we were growing every month. Um, and, I, and I think we had done like $60,000 in sales our year going into Shark Tank. Mm-hmm. And then I think we did like close to 100000 the week of the airing. Nice. <laughs> and, it was, <laughs> and it was all like, you know, online sales and um, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. It was just two of us. Uh, it, well, I, I should say there's two of us working on it full time, but it was the entire growth of Chapul was based on like volunteers that, you know, people that contributed because they believed in the mission and they, um, yeah, they just wanted to support something bigger than themselves, I think. Um, and so I was, I was involved with Capoeira. I don't know if you know what that is. A, it's a martial art, like Brazilian kind of dance okay, martial yeah. art. Uh-huh. But uh, it, it fosters a really strong community, usually, and it's in most cities in the U.S. at this point. But so there was a tight community, and so a lot of people out of that Capoeira community were coming in to rent by the hour kitchens and, and coming in help crank out making the cricket flour and hand making all the bars and putting on stickers, you know, packaging them by hand, putting on a sticker on the front, sticker on the back, putting in a little uh, generic box, and then throwing them on my bike and delivering them to the stores <laughs> nice yeah i love that just i mean you're you're in it you were making yeah. them you weren't going out and you didn't get a, a like a packaging like a company to, to start it from the beginning you were just using just kitchens. Hustle. that's commercial kitchens yeah, yeah. and that's I, awesome the first it, i and that was actually one of the hurdles too. Is a lot of commercial kitchens did not want insects coming in. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah. I think the health inspectors, that's a box of like no insect, visible insect parts. Okay, check. <laughs> so like, oh yeah, we got thousands of visible insect parts. In this <laughs> uh, but we, I found one that was actually the state fairgrounds and they have, you know, big kitchens for when the fair is in town, but, uh, and uh, lots of convection ovens, which is what I was using to dry out the insects originally. Um, but the facility is dormant for, you know, nine months out of the year. And so they rented it to me. I think they would do a full day rental, like eight to 5 PM. And, um, and I just, I can, I talked to the guy one day. I was like, Hey, do you mind if I just give you the key back at 8 AM the next morning? Uh, he's like, yeah, sure. Why not? And so I would just do 24 hours straight of just making cricket flour, listening to podcasts and just grinding it out. Cause I could get, you know, there's a significant amount of setup and cleanup time, you know, an hour or two hours on either side. And so if I could wedge in 20 hours in between setup, I could do, you know, a month's worth of production in, in just a 24 hour shift. And so, whew. nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those early days, it's, early I think days. when we think back, it's always like, wow, how, how did I even do that? Maybe sometimes because obviously you're still working extremely hard today and really hustling to, to make this happen. But it's the early days of any project. I feel there's just this magic where yeah. you're just in it so much that it's like, no, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to invest as much as I have to in terms of me and my time and energy. Yeah. yeah. You know, Love that. I, this is, this is from a friend of mine, but he, he had said another entrepreneur um, and he had said, you know, there was a certain amount of uh, naivety to, to the early days. Cause you, you just didn't know how much was stacked against you. 
in terms of being able to like how many people fail and like all the challenges you're totally unaware so you have this enthusiasm based on kind of a an innocence and and he said as in every endeavor he tries to maintain that because because it is a source of energy it's like you're doing the impossible <laughs> starting uh-huh. a, anyone starting a small business it's like nearly impossible if you look at the odds <laughs> but if you have that just drive you you can do it and so kind of turning your eye like how do you maintain that blind optimism kind of with your next endeavor as a seasoned entrepreneur so i I really appreciated that viewpoint and kind of going into these next phases of these business development i I keep that same like yeah i i I know that this is not by all senses of odds and statistics this is not going to work but it's going to (laughs) work yeah yeah it's really hard to maintain but it's important i mean that's what what gets us to where we're going um, how big is the company now? How many employees and what does it look like? Yeah, we're, I mean, we're constantly raising money. So the Chipool is kind of an automated. Uh, there's there's four of us um, on the Chipool side, the food. Mm-hmm. And then now we're we're building, we're kind of modeling and doing the project development for, right now we have six facilities that we're modeling right now in the US and each one would have about 30 employees. So these are mm-hmm. pretty large facilities. Um, that we're, we're trying to get off the ground. And so we're just doing all of the initial development work uh, around kind of getting those, getting the funding in for these big systems and getting the, the customers in advance for the, the large volumes of, of insect larvae coming out of them, which we're, we're, we're pretty close. Nice. Um, and are you doing specifically the larva for all these farms? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Black, black soldier fly, it's a native species to the U.S., but it can consume just a wide range of, of feeds um, and often mm-hmm. really low quality that there, you know, there's no other, you can't feed it to any other animal or um, there's no real other market application for. And so it's a, just a truly this regenerative insect and it's and that, and that's its role in nature is that it, as a fly, it doesn't have a mouth. It, it doesn't eat in its fly stage. It, it only eats in its larva stage when it's kind of subterranean. So it, it eats composting organic material. That's, it's kind of niche in natural ecosystems. And so that's where we're leaning into that as much as we can to have it eat, you know, these be a bio composter essentially, but then mm-hmm. also produce a really high quality you know, source of protein and fat also. Yeah. Um, do you foresee sticking with that for the like foreseeable future? Do you think you'll integrate other insects? Um, I mean, crickets or anything else? Yeah. I mean, there's just so much innovation happening. Um, uh, there's, yeah, there's, you know, s- specific species of mealworms that will eat styrofoam. And so we really? can just completely revolutionize what we, all of the materials that we have kind of ha- had this kind of linear view of, we, ha- we, ha- we use it for this and then it's out of our, our cycle. And so that's our focus is how do we make more circular agriculture, more systems integration, more closed loops, tighter closed loops, and, and less of a de- you know, deglobalizing our food supply. And so, yeah, there's lots of insects that can play many different roles. And um, yeah, in terms of, you know, culinary expression, there's, it's like saying, you know, what, you know, when people say, what do insects taste like? It's like saying, what do plants taste like? You know, yeah. there's <laughs> such a wide variety of nutritional values and uh, tastes and flavor profiles. And so, um, yeah, there's just so much room for innovation. We're really at these, these pioneering foundational stages of, of the industry and there's, yeah, we need it, you know, it's the, the health of the planet. It, it's critical and insects play an absolutely essential role in almost every terrestrial ecosystem on the planet. And it's, it's just absurd to think that they don't play a critical role in our agriculture as well. And, and the fact that we've, we've had widespread practices of eliminating insects is insane. And so <laughs> we'd like to go in the other direction. Yeah. In terms of that, do you have to do anything to uh, keep their ecosystem in, in line? Because I mean, like you mentioned, I mean, we're spraying crops to get rid of insects and uh, say predators or whatever. We're trying to really niche down and this is niche down but it's in a very specific regenerative way is there anything you have to worry about for um for the larva yeah definitely um 
I think one of the main things we we need to worry about is is heavy metals and the bioaccumulation of, of heavy metals. But in terms of, kind of more biological, they're they're actually incredible. And so it's not just you know the closed loop kind of achieving sustainability, but it's also that truly regenerative where they can solve some of the ills and the challenges that we've we've put on the plate of future generations, like overuse of pesticides, because we're seeing that the larvae themselves can actually break them down and they can break down residual antibiotics. Mm. You know, that we're looking at United Nations forecasting that antimicrobial resistant bacteria is going to kill more people by, than cancer in, by the year 2050 because of our overuse of antibiotics. And, and 90% of the antibiotics that we've, we've made have gone into animal feed. And so you have that residual in our natural environment. So you have this, like flourishing of the antimicrobial resistant bacteria and, and insects play a huge role in being able to break down those residual antibiotics and as well as E. coli. And, um, it really, it really comes down to, you know, their, their ecosystem of beneficial microbes is, is based on some of the concept of, of homeostasis. So it's not an antibiotic fighting a specific bacterial strain, but it's putting everything in balance. And so when we see, you know, uh, E. coli go in, it doesn't come out in terms of like it, the volume that, that you would necessarily see in more of a, a Petri dish or a more sterile environment like, a, you know, modern Americans gut microbiome. Um, and so they have just an incredible role to play at, at eliminating some of the, the contaminants that we've put in the natural and in, in our agricultural system at this point. Yeah, that's amazing. I had no idea about the antibiotic connection there. Um, yeah, love that. So um, before, not to take too much of your time, but before we uh, leave, I'd like to ask everyone one specific question. If everything you've done so far, it's all valid and everything you learned, all your experiences still carry over, but you were to wake up tomorrow and you hadn't actually done any of this yet, where would you start? <laughs> and how would you approach building like the beginning stages uh, of what you've built over the last eight years, but starting today? Oh my goodness. What a question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's been and such yeah. a journey and I feel like I've learned so much. Uh -huh. I think I would and run yeah, and hide. That's what I would do. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I feel like uh, the image I have is like, I was like, ah, oh, I'm going to create like this little snowball and see, uh, you know, what can happen. And, you know, as it starts rolling down, it just gets bigger and bigger. And somewhere along the line, I found myself like out in front of it, like running. Like, ah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's an interesting question because I, I never um, had any ambition to be an entrepreneur or to, you know, lead a company or, or do any of that. And it was, it was a, I had a sense of obligation. It was like, this needs to happen for the future. You know, nobody's doing it right now. I'll I'll take on this role, and I, sometimes I still feel that way. I'm I'm just doing it out of obligation for the future. I'm, I wouldn't if I had to craft everything. I wouldn't be like I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to do this, and I think at this point I'm probably uh, unemployable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, don't know, I, I hear that. that. Of, a, of an officer desk at this point, just like, my grooming over the past decade. But um, man, I. I don't know where I was. Yeah, I might just go find a little plot of land and, and do my own thing and hide. It and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I started something, you know, finish it, and, and um, mm -hmm. I signed up for, for the task. And so it's uh, it, at times it's daunting, but um, at the same time, more and more people are jumping in. And I've tried to foster a really collaborative environment within the within it industry so i mean that's what we were doing from day one was trying to start an industry not just a company and so um you know maintaining that collaborative environment has been really uh beneficial and healthy and, and so it's it's i don't feel like it's just me you know anymore like uh, as much so there's there's a really healthy ecosystem around us to to really carry the industry forward at this point um uh you know i'd probably i'd probably i probably do exactly what i'm doing yeah. Yeah. I'd probably be jump right into the development of, of insect agriculture. So I've been crafting the business model around where the bottleneck for the industry has been. And and so that's kind of currently where it's at is is demonstrating that it can be done. 
Uh, that's kind of it's it's been shown at all academic levels in terms of nutrition, in terms of its ability to process waste, and and now it's just investment dollars. It's the same thing of like consumers. Uh, there's not a lot of investors that want to be the first to do something. <laughs> so uh-huh. finding those innovators and pioneers that want to go big for you know solution based um, projects uh, to to do something substantive for the future, not just kind of uh, address um, um, symptoms to a, a dying planet. Yeah, I mean, I love all this. I love your mis- mission. I love what you're doing. So thanks so much for taking the time to chat about it. Um, yeah, of course, for anyone, yeah. Where could we send people to uh, learn more and see what you're up to? Yeah, ch- chapool.com, C-H-A-P-U-L. Uh, dot com is was our the food company and then chapool farms uh, dot com is is where you can see a little bit more about our our uh, insect farming operations perfect well thanks again i really appreciate it and i hope you enjoy the rest of your day thank you very much and i sincerely appreciate the time and and such thoughtful questions it was a pleasure yeah it was a good time (laughs) take care all right take it easy A big thanks goes out to Pat for joining me on this episode. Be sure to check out everything he's up to at chapool.com and chapoolfarms.com. That's C-H-A-P-U-L.com. As always, this episode of Starting Now is brought to you by Built. At Built, we help you get started online. Whether you want to start a blog or a business, head on over to built.co. That's B-Y-L-T dot C-O to get started. Built. Your website. Built for you. Simply. Finally, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, be sure to check out the video version of the show on YouTube. You'll find all the links for this episode at built.co slash 013. That's B-Y-L-T dot C-O slash 013. Well, that's all for this week. Again, I'm Jeff Saris. This has been Starting Now, and I'll see you next time.